Norman Bushnell has said that everybody believes in innovation, but they do so till they actually see it. After that, they think, oh no, that'll never work. It's too different. And that, in a sense, is the difficulty that scientists and innovators always face in some form or the other. I'm here today to share with you my journey of innovation in the broad realm of healthcare. But before I begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what is the problem that we're trying to solve. Imagine a map of the world. You would imagine something like this because we're all used to having a map based on geographic or political boundaries. But if we were to look at the world in terms of other parameters, let's say health-based parameters, would it look the same? Let's have a look. This is the map which does not depict the political boundaries, but it depicts early neonatal mortality. What do we mean by this? It means what is the risk of a baby who is born of dying within the first week of birth, per thousand life births. And as this image shows you, there's a gross difference across various countries. And you see that developing countries, India as well as Africa, have a remarkable increase in this rate and hence are shown bigger on this depictive map. Again, when we look at neonatal mortality, which means over a 28-day period, once again, a similar trend is seen. The rates can change from 0.9 per 1,000 live births in Japan to 25.4 in India and can go as high as 42 to 45 in some of the countries in Africa. This seems like a gross, unfair situation. Why should a baby die just because where it is born and because it does not have access to the correct amount of healthcare facilities? And this picture remains the same even when we look at other parameters. This one, under five child mortality. And once again, you see the same grim picture, the developing world having much higher rates of these under five mortality. Now, the question is, is this meant to happen? We must do something to make healthcare, technologies, services much more acceptable and affordable to all, regardless of where they are. And here we see that even in maternal mortality, a similar picture emerges. And so this is the problem that we're trying to address. How can we have more equitable distribution of healthcare technologies and developed technologies which can be made accessible and affordable to all? And this kind of discrepancy is not only across countries, but within a country, there's a rural-urban divide, right? In rural areas, in remote areas, it's much more difficult for the same individual to get access to the facilities. A simple thing like giving birth to a baby can then become so dangerous. So let's look at these infographics, which show you that it's 50 times more likely that there's going to be an under five mortality in the sub-Saharan African countries as opposed to those countries which fare the best in this parameter. Similar picture is in maternal mortality. 99% of the deaths are in the developing countries. This brings us to the need of an accessible, affordable and available healthcare system which has technologies, development, deployment as well as delivery and yet of the highest quality. We believe that science and innovation can play a role to bridge this gap. And most of my work over the last few years has been in the development of innovations to make a difference to healthcare, such that they can be more affordable, more accessible, and to the reach of the remotest areas and the poorest of the poor. Now, before I tell you about the actual innovations, I'd like to tell you how my journey began. Well, initially, I was a medical doctor and I was practicing in a rural area in Maharashtra. And one of the things I noticed was there were a lot of these tiny babies which were born before term. 
And unfortunately, in that rural area, the infrastructure that was available was not enough for us to be able to save their lives. Also, when we tried to transport them to referral centers, sometimes we couldn't get them there quickly. It seemed like such an unfortunate situation. It kept going in my mind, can we do more? We must help these tiny babies. And that's when I explored a little more. And this is what I found. Prematurity is actually a global health problem. Not only that, India has the dubious distinction of having the highest number of preterm babies per year across the world. We have more than 35 lakh preterm babies. And now this compounded with the fact that if the baby is born in a rural area, most likely it's a home birth, as well as they do not have access to intensive care facilities. So can we do something to make sure that their lives make a difference and they are saved? So one of these problems was how do these babies breathe? And that is the first thing that struck me. And we started our journey of innovation for that. To understand this, I'm showing you here on the left hand side, the smallest units of our lungs, they actually have these little air sacs called alveoli. So it's like a bunch of grapes, right? And each of these can get distended like a balloon. So when air goes in, it inflates. But in the case of a balloon, when the air comes out, it deflates. In the lungs, this must not happen. We must prevent the air sacs from deflating when the air comes out. And that is the challenge that these babies face. Now, in the normal babies, the ones which are born in full term, what happens is their lungs secrete this substance. This is known as a surfactant. Now, this surfactant lines these tiny air sacs and keeps them patent, prevents the air sac from collapsing. The preterm babies, they are born before term. Their lungs have not matured enough, so they are unable to make this material. And so it's a constant struggle for them to keep their air sacs open. And conventionally, these babies are treated by transferring them to the intensive care unit and putting them under ventilator therapy. And so the question in my mind was, can we do something so that we develop a mimicked surfactant-like material and give it to the lungs of these babies? And that was the challenge I started out my innovation journey on. And then the first problem that I faced was that our education system is extremely compartmentalized. Even within science, if you like physics and maths more, then you go into physical sciences or engineering. If you like biology more, you go into life sciences or medicine. And then we assume that these are these separate roads and they will never meet. Well, this is the reality of the roads. The roads are all intertwined and interconnected. And real world problems are like these roads. They do not have solutions in silos of disciplines. You have to work across disciplines to be able to create solutions which are meaningful for real life problems. And so we found that for developing this surfactant, we needed physics, chemical engineering, as well as neonatology to work together to be able to develop a mimicking material which can act as that effect. Initially, it was a challenge to get all these different disciplines to try and work together. But finally, we were able to do this and we have a patented technology which works efficiently to keep the air sacs of these babies open just like the natural surfactant. And then the question was, we also wanted to make it accessible. So there, we went one step further, over and above the conventional treatment. In the developed world, this kind of surfactant therapy is usually given as injections directly into the trachea, which is the main airway, in the intensive care unit. So what we developed is tiny nanoparticle-based systems, which are aerosol mists. And these can be given as an inhalation mist. And still, they go deep down into the air sacs. What is the advantage of this? We now have access. So this affordable mist can be given to the babies in rural areas. 
can be given during transportation and can help save these babies. Initially, when we were successful in this innovation, I was naive enough to think there was a problem, we found a solution, and the work was done. But then, over the years, I learned the intricacies of business, product development, product commercialization, and deployment. And it took us several years to then work with a business startup to then scale this technology and actually make it potentially available for deployment. And we hope that with this, we will be able to save several lives of newborn babies. The next example that I want to tell you about is a problem where not only is the solution there, but it still doesn't seem to help the problem. I am deficiency anemia. Again, going back to the map, you see that there's a large incidence in India as well as in the developing countries. So what can we do to help prevent the bad outcomes of iron deficiency anemia. So we all know that there are iron pills and folic acid pills and girls and women need to take them, particularly so during pregnancy. This is important for the health of the mother as well as of the child. But time and again, we would hear that there's very low compliance. People just don't take them, right? And there are various issues for this. When we spoke to the actual users, we found out what is it that these women needed. Women needed a way of taking this seamlessly in their daily lives, something which they did not have to remember and yet did not have any irritation in the stomach due to taking this. So I wanted a final solution which would be accessible and would have high compliance. So without any biases, one of the thoughts that came to my mind is women all over the world, regardless of their socioeconomic status, love cosmetics. And it may be in the form of a coloring agent for the skin, maybe mehendi, maybe a lip balm. What would happen if we were to develop a technology by which the nutrients could actually be seamlessly given along with the cosmetics? So that's the challenge that we try to address. And then the first issue that came up is that the skin itself is a barrier. This is a picture of the skin. And the outermost layer of the skin is like a brick and mortar wall. It prevents substances from going in. And so we had to develop technology to try to fool the system, to make it very similar to the mortar between the bricks. And these tiny little particles would then squeeze through the mortar, go across the wall, and pass through skin. So that was the first challenge. The second challenge was people were not comfortable with the fact that nutrients could also be delivered through anything apart from food or through the mouth. And this was where we went through an unconventional route. And then speaking to various stakeholders, we were finally be able to convince them. And we were successful in developing this innovation, which is in the form of a wide range of cosmetics, be they lotions, be they lip salve, multani mitti face packs, mehendi, you name it, and we can have this as a nutrient-loaded cosmetic. This is being scaled up by our industry partners, and we're ready for deployment amongst women. We hope that this will make a huge difference in terms of affordability and accessibility to a nutrient which is extremely important for health and well-being. Now, while we were doing this, our partners who are public health experts came to us and told us, can you do a similar thing in oils? Because in indigenous uh, practices, there's a lot of infant massage. So if we could incorporate nutrients within that, we would then be able to allow these babies to benefit from the nutrients. So we worked on that challenge and we were able to develop the oils with the nutrient loaded technology. And this is being transferred to our clinical and NGO partner and is actually being deployed in field trials in rural Maharashtra in the Vadu area. We hope that this can make a huge difference in terms of integrating the behavioral practices of traditional massage as well as incorporating nutrients and helping the development of these babies, which are the future of our generation. Apart from this, the last example that I want to give you 
is to address the other end of the spectrum, the elderly. Over the world, the population of the elderly is going on increasing. And it is estimated that it can reach 21.5% by 2050. Now the question is, for the elderly, there are a lot of issues in terms of degenerative diseases, as well as in terms of bladder control and dysfunction. So what is needed here is improvement in quality of life. So what happens in bladder diseases is if you give the drug orally or as an injection, hardly anything reaches the bladder. But if you give the drug directly into the bladder, well, it lasts only for a couple of hours and comes out with urination. So that's the challenge. So we want it to be effective as well as improve the quality of life of the elderly. So we wanted a technology which could be used without a surgical intervention and yet last long so that you could have low frequency of administration and improved quality of life. We developed what is called as a smart in situ gelling system. So when it is put in, it's like water, it's low viscosity, so no, no surgery required, it can be put inside the bladder. But once it comes in contact with the bladder wall, it changes its state and becomes like a jelly. So it's a gel-like substance which then coats the inner wall of the bladder and this sticks on and then acts as a depot. And you can fine-tune it to act for weeks or even months, giving you a higher quality of life and requirement of very little frequency of dosing. And this, again, is being scaled up by our industry partners. So I've given you various examples of innovations for healthcare in different segments. But during our journey, what did we learn? Well, the one common thing that we learned is that we must have an open mind. It is only when the mind is open that it is functional, very much like a parachute. What do we mean by open mind? Well, we mean openness to ideas. We also mean openness to looking at unconventional out-of-the-box solutions. We mean partnerships, partnerships across disciplines, partnerships across stakeholders, and partnerships across academia industry, as well as an easy-to-use solution. Complexity of solutions make them less accessible. We must have easy solutions so that the users can actually take benefit of the technology. And N is the needs of the users have to be met. So what is the pain point that we are addressing? Who is the user? And what is it that they are going to benefit over the well conventional ways? If we keep these in mind, the open attitude can allow us to do a lot. And science and innovation can allow us to make a difference for inclusive healthcare. We can develop solutions which are accessible and affordable to all and help in bridging the inequities that exist in today's world. And I'd like to end with a quote from Nelson Mandela. We must remember it always seems impossible until it's done. Thank you.